hello <laughs> to my RoboFun audience. Um, and I want to welcome my friend and colleague, Paul Tatter. How are you, Paul? Fine. It's great to have you with us. Uh, Paul has a amazingly interesting career in trying to figure out education, uh, hands-on, being a teacher, being a leader. And we're going to hear all about what he's done and what he's doing now, which is if I could leave everything, I would jump in, Paul, right with you. So it's very, very exciting. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to say that I am Laura Hart. I'm the founder and CEO of RoboFund. We are a New York City company located on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, where we offer children creative and playful and joyful experiences with technology, which are engaging and in which they learn to love learning. Um, we run online, we run in person, we're at 102nd and Broadway. We got a lot of programs coming up for uh, the holiday season. For those of you wistful to get into New York during the holiday season, but might not want a child with you all the time, you can drop them off with us. They can have an incredibly great time and learn really cool things. Then you can go off and have a little bit of adult, you know, time with your spouse, time shopping, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, go to robofund.org to learn more. And if you j join my mailing list, uh, I send out a blog twice a week with information about what we're offering, but also about parenting. I'm the uh, mom of a, a child who was homeschooled from 11 to 18. And my blog often talks about ways to support learning that are not necessarily traditional. And now that brings us to, to Paul. Uh, Paul uh, is joining us from New Mexico, where he currently lives, but he's had an amazing career across the country in learning and teaching and living. And um, so why don't we start? Tell us a little bit about yourself, Paul. Um, well, let's see. I, I've, I've been engaged in some form of learning pretty much my whole life. Um, and the emphasis there would be, you know, my own learning um, as uh -huh. I continue to learn uh, now. Um, I, uh, my parents are, are immigrants from the, what's now called the Czech Republic. Um, and uh, I grew up in a, a small dairy farming town in Wisconsin. Um, my first job was milking cows. And... Um, how old were you when you did that? About nine. Uh-huh. Um, and um, I got interested in, in how people learn, I think, when later on, uh, uh, when I was quite young, I was a, a laboratory technician in, an, in, in a, in a, immunology, a research immunology uh, department in, uh, in Denver and um, got very interested in uh, the in thinking about the immune system as a as a um, a, a learning process that that the immune system was uh, um, a system that learned but uh, but without language without what appeared to be consciousness and and so that fascinated me that this that that something at the, at that scale uh, could be a, that learning could be attributed to that and so I got more and more interested in how things learn. So, um, so just to stop you for a minute, so you're doing this as graduate work or undergraduate work in college? No, this was a side a side job, okay. um, which started when I was a senior in high school and went all through my college years and a, okay. a little bit after that. Okay. Um, and, and also during that time, I was a I I, I was a first a drummer in and a piano player in a in a big band, an 18 piece big band in Denver, which was wow. pretty much fun. I learned a lot. And one of the things that was interesting about that is that, is that in both of those environments, uh, I, I spent a lot of time with uh, a great diversity of people who were older than me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, in a great range of older, they weren't just 10 years older, there were some that were, but there are some that were 20, 30, 40 years older than me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, so uh, access to those people and 
and engagement with them, I think, was a very important part of my education. Um, and then I uh, uh, later on uh, started three different experimental schools with other people. Um, and uh, this was at a time in the late 60s and the early 70s where there was sort of this great uh, rising of people doing experimental education. And, um, and I learned a lot doing that. Like open um, classrooms was one model I remember. Yeah, and, and most of the things that I was engaged with were, were new ways of, of, of teaching and, and new opportunities for learning, different ways of structuring the day and so, mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and what we created uh, inside the buildings and outside the buildings. Um, so th those are the kinds of experiments that we were doing. And uh, um, then later on, I, I spent some years teaching in public schools here and there and in various places. Uh, when I moved to New Mexico, I spent time teaching uh, in public schools on, uh, on Native American reservations. Um, spent time teaching in four different colleges and universities and then, and then um, became the executive director at three different science centers around the country. That's sort of the... So that's, the, that, that's quite, quite a, an incredible career. Um, so what what are you currently doing? Well, so right now I'm the board president of uh, a nonprofit organization that's called the Corellis Institute for New Education. And by new education, it, we mean completely new, that we are trying to rethink the way public education is uh, provided in this country, starting from the ground up. So we're not assuming that, that education in the 21st century should look anything like schooling. Uh, and we have uh, a, a proposal for a new vision of, of what public education might look like. And, uh, and anyone that's interested in that can um, uh, look at our website. We've put a bunch of stuff on our website, uh, which is uh, uh, www.neweducation.org. Okay. I have it up there in um, our chat for people. Okay, thanks. Sure. I see there's a delay, so this is this is going to be interesting because my mouth is not moving in sync with my voice. So, so sure. folks will have to get used to that. So, so you are located outside of Albuquerque? Is that right? yes? Yep, we're just across the river from Albuquerque. Okay. All right. The Rio Grande. Cool. So do you want me to pull up the image of what you're doing or do you want to talk about it first? Sure. Uh, unless you have other questions. But, uh, um, well, I, I mean, actually, uh, does the work now you, you do now resonate with anything from your childhood? Uh, certainly does. I'm, uh, I mean, in, in my childhood, I had because I grew up in a small town, I had access to all kinds of environments. I had access to the countryside, to the woods, to farms, to all kinds of animals that lived uh, on the farms and in the woods. Uh, I had access to most of the other people that lived in the community, because in a small town, everybody knows everybody. And, um, and I also had access to a large range of adults that were always interested in in showing me their their work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you know there was a there, there was an electronics repair place and the person who ran that was always interested in, in showing me and other young people who were interested in you know how to fix things you know how do electronics work and the the, the, the local photographer was like that the local druggist was like that, always willing to explain things and chemistry and so forth. And so the town was full of, of adults who were doing their, their careers, their, their, um, the things that mattered to them and they were all open and they all were actually part of the educational system in that community. Yeah. And so that has influenced me a lot. And, um, uh, yeah, I think I think um, 
there are a lot of things like that from my childhood. We we also had a, we were pretty free range kids. Um, that that yeah. the community was safe. We could be anywhere, and and oftentimes our parents had no idea where we were until we came home for dinner. Right. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Um, yeah. So can you, do you think about certain experiences that really come back to you that affected your path and affected your desires? It sounds like many of these are some of them. Yeah, I think, I think those are the strongest things. Right. Um, uh, uh, I think another thing that affected my path are the things that I was allowed to do and that I tried to do. So, the, you know, it was an environment where it was okay to try a lot of stuff. If you wanted, if you saw something and, and you thought, well, I want to try that, not only could you do that, but there are probably people that would help you do that. Uh, so that was something that I think was important. It expanded, it expanded the possibilities of, in the world of things that I could try to do and, and experience, see what they were like. I think that has lasted for, for a long time. That's great. Okay, I'm gonna pull up the image. Um, okay. You can start talking about what you're currently doing. Share. Screen. Okay, so um, uh, the Corrales Institute for New Education uh, consists of uh, a core of about 30 people and then participants, uh, we have about 150 participants from eight different countries in 26 states. Uh, and uh, we've been working for the last three years on, on uh, developing uh, a coherent concept of, of a new way of educating. And, of de and uh, we have a proposal for a, an entirely new institution of public education, which we're calling a learning park. Now, let's see, that, that image just shrank. There, there we go. So we, we put up this, here's a drawing. It's just a concept drawing. It's nothing, it's nothing architectural. It's just, it's just a drawing to communicate the idea. And I wanted to explain a little bit about, about what this is. Uh, the, the first thing that, it, that uh, is significant and different about what we're suggesting is, is that we are proposing a very large... Whoa. <laughs> um, I'm gonna mute myself. I'm in New York City, as you can hear. I can hear that. Um, anyway, so the uh, the first thing we're proposing is that is is that a, a new place of learning should be a very large, diverse and complex e environment that is entirely devoted to learning, but it, large enough that so, for example, we're suggesting it should be m maybe thirty acres of of land, uh, and and that thirty acres should be filled with. Uh, uh, resources and environmental qualities that are as rich and full as as possible of uh, the world itself. So we we think this 30 acres needs to represent the diversity that's found in the world. So, for example, uh, in this um, in this drawing up in the upper left hand corner, you see it's sort of a main street with businesses. There's small businesses there. And, and our thinking is that those, those are actual uh, functioning businesses, uh, but they will, they will double as places of learning, as, as learning laboratories. And so the people who are operating those businesses would also be uh, people who are educators, who are helping other people learn the, the, the elements of their business. So there could be an architect there, there could be a compounding druggist, a furniture store, um, electronics store, so on, a restaurant, um, uh, clothier, so on, um, and uh, and and daycare centers, a child daycare center, a senior a senior daycare center, uh, those kinds of human resources, uh, someone who helps with taxes and so forth. Um, then, uh, just on the left hand side, to stay there, just below the. Uh, the small businesses, the main street, uh, is a, um, an orchard with all kinds of, of uh, fruit trees and, and nut trees that can be harvested. Uh, and below that is a very large organic garden. Um, and below that is a, is a greenhouse. And then in the lower uh, left-hand corner is a, a, is a, a museum. Um, uh, we were thinking of it as a, 
a, a science, technology, engineering, and art museum. Uh, but it could be anything. It, it's a public space. It's, it's a place where where people, the public can come to this place of learning and experience the things that uh, are, the participants are doing. And then uh, um, to go back up underneath, just below the, uh, the business uh, main street, there's a circular building, which would uh, uh, be the, the place of, it's a meeting house. Um, and it would be the place of, of uh, govern governance uh, and I'll get to that a little later. Um, but then there's a, a, a farmer's market to the right of it. And then uh, on the far side of the, uh, of the business area is a very large building, which is a performing um, with, with, you know, stage and all that sort of thing for all kinds of performing arts. Um, and then, of course, you see the great central grassy area with a hill and ponds and a, and a small woods. Um, and to the far left uh, is actually a farm, uh, the, the little the reddish uh, building at the lower right hand. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm at the right side now. The lower right hand corner is a barn uh, for farm animals. And then above that is a, uh, a machine shop and a maintenance shop, um, uh, a little outdoor theater that's, that's uh, above that. And then in the upper Right hand corner are uh, as a, the, the buildings that are in a circle are buildings that are designed for different purposes. So, uh, so that they, they're learning centers so that at some time they might specialize in, for example, the sciences or the aesthetic arts or social inquiries and so on. Uh, and, and then at the very top right um, are residence buildings, uh, 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 playing field for soccer or hockey or whatever. Um, so that there's an opportunity for people to actually reside in, uh, in, in this space. Anyway, so you can see that this, what we're talking, we're talking about is, a, is an environment that is as rich as possible as, as we can make it in 30 acres that represents the richness and the complexity of the world around us. So it reminds me of two different things. Um, and I'm going to say this quickly because I can see an ambulance coming down the street. Um, one is it reminds me of a small town. And the second is it reminds me of sort of a visit to like Colonial Williamsburg. And I'm wondering if you could talk about both of those. And then I'm muting myself while this ambulance goes. Um, yeah, it does resemble a small town. And, and again, it goes back to that, that idea that I was saying is that we, we think a place of learning this new institution ought to be representative of the world at large as much as it can possibly be in 30 acres of land. So, so it is, it is a, a small town. And we're also thinking about the people participating in this as, as being a, a small community. Uh, so a second, so that the first principle that we're proposing uh, is, uh, is this diverse complex environment. Now, why are we doing that? Well, we're doing that because the, the current uh, environments for learning, mostly in schools, uh, are in comparison austere and barren. If you look at the architecture of school buildings, they're, they're made uh, to be easy to clean and to, and to manage, but they're, but they're not rich environments like, like for, for example, what this drawing is showing. Um, and, and so that's something that we're trying to correct, that, that we think that the, the, the relatively constrained environments of our current places of learning, and I mean uh, uh, all the way from kindergarten through college. Um, I mean, uh, it, it, my son just graduated from Hampshire College of any place. This sort of resembles Hampshire College because they, a, a, they have a farm on site. They have a museum on site. So, uh, yeah, I can see it from that. Yeah, point. that's not that's not typical. That's not oh, typical. No, 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 that's not typical. A public high school or public grade school right. or or a public university. Right. Um, right. And and the what's also not typical is there are some private schools that have wonderful grounds, but they 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 make very limited use of it. Yeah. And that's because we're thinking that education is about schooling indoors. It's about reading books. It's about being in a classroom, hearing people talk. Uh, 
and, and not engaging in the, uh, the environment outside uh, as a significant part. Now, of course, people go on field trips. Uh, they, they do that sort of thing. But we're talking about a place where, where you can be engaged in a complex environment every day. Right. Uh, and there are free choices about where to be engaged. So a second thing that you mentioned was, you know, this is like a village uh, and, and a village has a multi-generational population. And so that's a, a second thing that we're proposing is that, that this place of learning, a learning park would be, would be a place, a, a multi-generational multi place of learning. So there would be as many senior citizens learning in this place as there are elementary age children. And all the way through, it's a lifelong, Long learning place, uh, and and live nearby could actually participate uh, in in this uh, learning park uh, for as long as they live there. They could live. They could participate for an entire lifetime if they never leave town. Um, so one of the things that and why are we doing that? Why are we saying that this place needs to be multi generational? A new a new place of learning has to be multi generational. Well. Um, the, there are, are huge numbers of reasons for that. One is that um, that this is a very natural, normal human environment, is to have people of all kinds of different ages and different skills, different backgrounds that you can have access to. Uh, secondly, um, there uh, it, it's a very practical thing because if you have a, a large number of different people of different ages, then there are ma many, many more choices. Uh, for who you can engage with and what you can learn from them. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because most of our public schools, our, our public places of education, even colleges and universities, limit the access of people to each other. And they limit them in very strange ways. So for example, in, most, in, in every place of learning, the students are segregated by age. This, this applies to elementary, secondary, college, even other places of learning. The, um, the people who are learning are segregated by age. Yeah. Well, that's to totally arbitrary. And so we're trying to say, we're not going to do that. We're proposing that we do away with that, those, that age segregation. And that, and that we give people access to each other of all different kinds of ages. Because, for example, just take, for example, uh, uh, you, you could take any topic, but say, take music for example. So, so you, you can you, you can easily imagine a twelve-year-old who who is is in love with a saxophone and plays the saxophone really well. Yep. And and there's no reason to for this child to be to be forced to play with his peers, right? Or right. her peers. She may I, I, actually. In, a, in an environment like a learning park, she may have the opportunity to play with some 30 year olds or some 60 year olds. Um, right. and, I, I and have a, an example of this uh, or, or an anecdote. Um, as you know, I worked with Seymour Papert for 30 years and uh, much of our time was rather casual time, like driving to a site where we were gonna teach or he lived near me and, and sharing a meal. Um, and he told this, you know, he talked about the age segregation. And, and one way he talked about it is imagine if you go to a party and at, at the front door, the host says, OK, all the 21 year olds are in that corner. All the 22 year olds are over there. 30 year olds, you're out on the terrace. You know, we'd never do that. But uh -huh. somehow in education, we feel like that that is very important. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good that's a good analog, and and of course it makes no sense. It makes no sense in education either. Right. So, uh, so there's the village. You know, the the village is not just uh, is not only a place, an environment, but it's all the people that inhabit it. And and so if it takes a village to raise a child, th that village needs to have people of all ages uh, in it. Um, and so that's some that's something that we're proposing that is not being done in the public school system. A third thing is that, go ahead. Uh, well, we have some nice comments on our chat. Uh, Cassandra, oh, thanks for, for being here. And Susan Cohen says that that sax player could also teach anyone who always wanted to learn to play the sax, which is me. I'm dying to learn how to play the sax anyway. <laughs> um, so, yes. 
Well, so that's actually what Susan has commented on is actually a very important principle about what we're proposing. And that is that everyone is both a, a, an educator and a learner. And and right. and it doesn't matter who you are, what age you are, uh, we expect th that you will have both roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so no matter, yeah, so again, there's, there's, there's things that older people can learn from young people and vice versa. Uh, there, there are no exceptions to that. We can have, um, you, you can have a corner where all the tech savvy teenagers and 20 year olds can help the rest of us who can't figure out things on our phones or computers. So. Yeah. And, and, and then because you're living in a, in an active uh, community of, of people, you know, there, there'll be folks who come along and drag the tech savvy teenagers off to the or to you know to place her or whatever is going to happen uh or to act in a play or something like that so that, that there's always this movement people aren't stuck in something for a very very long time of course people need to follow passions and we need to give them space to do those to follow those passions we need to give them support to follow their passions because a great deal of important learning happens when you're pursuing some passion that you have. Um, but now another thing that we're proposing, again, and, and I'll explain why, but we're, we're proposing that um, that this place operate as a democracy, that it, it's managed democratically, that everyone has a voice, uh, that, I mean, it's, it, it, that it operates as a direct democracy. And, and we think this is important for several reasons. One is that the the most fundamental purpose of public education, of education for everyone in a democracy is to become a, an effective contributing participant, citizen participant in the democracy. Otherwise, what's the purpose of, school, of public schooling at all? So underlying it all is this, is this, this public purpose of public education which is to, which is to is to help people become uh, effective contributing members of the public, and in the in, you know the the body politic. Yeah, you, now, you said something yesterday when we were preparing for this, which has really resonated, especially in our time of challenging and very difficult politics about uh, how the field of law, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, how, how it doesn't, we don't know about our own legal system. Oh yeah, I think I was commenting that, that every major institution in society has an educative function, mm -hmm. has an imperative to, to, to educate the public about its act about its own activities, and that and that's something that our legal system has failed terribly at, is it, 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 it helping to educate the public, helping the public learn about about how the, our legal system works, what laws are, um, how laws be, you know come into being, how they get changed, uh, how people make determinations about what the laws mean. Um, and, and one of the things that's important about the meaning of things is, is shared experience, that, that, that when we use language to refer to things in the world or to refer to our actions or our behaviors or our feelings, that, that, that we end up having to interpret that, those things on, our, on the basis of our own experience. And you know, in a world now where so much is going on on the internet, the, the the experiences that people have are not actually shared in the real world. So that, um, for example, when I use language and 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 the, and the meaning of words to me, uh, mean the same things to other people with whom I share ex life experiences. But if I use those words online with somebody I've never met before, there's no way of telling what that other person thinks I'm saying. Right. Because because the words mean something to that other person based on her life experiences with the people that she shares experiences with. And so we have this huge problem uh, the, uh, of just communicating. And we can see that all around us in, you know, in the last 10 years, right. it, this not only is this communication problem a problem, but a problem of listening you know, to each other has become a problem and, and really trying to imagine what the other people are meaning or saying or 
worried about or have feelings about has also become a problem. So one of the things that we're proposing is that it's very important for this place to, to function as a democracy. And that's because we believe that you don't become uh, an effective participant in a democracy by reading about it. You know, you, you can't get a book on how to be a, an, an effective person, a citizen in a democracy, and then all of a sudden you are. You can't become an effective citizen by getting listening to a lecture on how to be an effective citizen. You right. only become an effective citizen by practicing being an effective participant in a democracy. So it's a very important for this place to function that way. Now, why are we doing that? Well, it's because our, our current places of learning are not based on a democracy. They're based on authority of some kind or another. So they're based on the authority. They're based on authority that, that teachers have. Uh, they're based on the authority of a curriculum. Uh, and, and so they're based on, on, on things that happen every day that are determined by people who are not actually participating in that, except for the teachers. But the teachers are constrained by curriculum and by the administration and by these other kinds of rules as well. So, so all these decisions about what goes on in schools are made by people who are absent. And, and some of the biggest things, so say, for example, curriculum are, is decided by people who are a long ways away. Um, and they decide what curriculum should it consist of. Well, so we're saying that, that none of those things are very useful. They're all constraining. And that we need to, in, this, in a new environment, this, this, in this democratic way, um, the, the, we need to change how, uh, the, the, where the authority uh, for deciding what to do in education comes from. Um, so we, before we go on, we have an interesting comment and, and question uh, from Cindy uh, Candelario. Uh, this concept is super beautiful. I love the exchange of passion and craft. What roles would you see yourselves taking lead on at the Learning Park? And Cindy says, for example, she would like to work in the healing and medicine center and also in the theater and art therapy. And definitely she'd like to get her hands in the dirt and help grow the garden. Um, so, Paul, what roles would you see yourself playing? Uh, well, so uh, I would see myself um, um, participating in things that I wanted to learn about more. Uh, um, uh, so again, um, there, John Holt has made an interesting comment about his learning to play the cello. You know, he said that there, there, uh, you know, when I tell people that I'm learning to play the cello, there comes into their mind two two very different things. One is that that I spend some time learning to play the cello, after which I actually play the cello. Right. Uh, and of course, that's just silliness because because learning to play the cello and playing the cello are exactly the same thing. And any good cellist is going to continue learning to play the cello for the rest of her life. Right. And uh, so that would be my situation. There are things that I can do uh, that I've practiced uh, in, in, you know, up until now, and and I want to learn more about. And so I might engage with other people in that in that process of you know learning more about something. Uh, and um, you know, like like carpentry and cabinet making, and you know, I. I, I spent time building small exhibits uh, uh, for museums, and um, so I can learn more about that. And um, so I might engage with other people who are at all different, at all different points in learning about the same kind of thing. Uh, and there's no reason for us to, that are at all different points to just work together, to to be, you know, in a uh, in a practice room or in a shop or 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 you know, in a, in a, a reading circle, um, all of those things. So, uh, yeah. And then, and then I think the other thing I just, you know, I could just be grandpa. <laughs> right. know, the, right. That could be one of the things I do in a place like this. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yep. You know, yeah. And whatever people, whatever right. people use grandpas for, I could, I could do that. I mean, it's, th some of the things that really, really resonate for me is, um, you know, I live in a big building in New York City, 
And there's lots of intergenerational relationships because of that. And it's a very healthy thing. And it's been very healthy in a pandemic when we're all a little bit more, you know, severely more limited. Uh, but intergenerational really doesn't exist nearly the way it has um, in our past. I think we, I think it has to now be intentional. Right. One of the things that, that we've noticed, and I've noticed during my, you know, during my career in schooling, is, is how difficult it is to get parents to show up in school. Uh, you know, this has been uh, something that schools have advocated for for years and years and years. We want parents to come in and participate, you know, and do this and that, but but parents don't. And a part of it is that that the 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 schooling environment is not is not friendly to grownups. Right. It's you very know, constricted. Uh, it's very. Oh yeah. I mean, you know. Uh, I wouldn't want to just hang out in a classroom for a half a day. Uh, it, a typical uh, public school right. classroom is it, right. terribly constrictive and and kind of you, f you feel nervous about the rules and you feel nervous about what well what can I do that's of any use here. So you know, anyway, but in a place like a learning park, there's much more free flow. You can feel comfortable with what skills you have, and you can feel comfortable with whatever skills you don't have. And yeah. Uh, and um, so that would be a, an important part of, of encouraging people to participate. Well, anyway, so so the the next thing that we're proposing, um, was, as I, and I want to leave democracy here because again, public schools are not places to practice democracy. Uh, Very sad. So an, another thing that we're proposing is that is that an institution of learning needs to continually evolve. Now this relates back to democracy. Uh, um, and, but unlike, unlike school. So for example, if um, I wrote this little paragraph because I thought this might be like one, like your story about that Seymour Papert said, I said, it was suppose you're a Martian and you were sent uh, uh, to earth to investigate what's going on down there. And you were carefully observing our educational system, our schooling system. And you would undoubtedly conclude that the purpose of public education is about maintaining the social, political, and economic order, about maintaining the status quo, and ensuring that the future is a lot like today, or perhaps like a more profitable today, and about training individuals to fit into this status quo, into this order that exists. And that is, you know, that's pretty true. If you actually looked at public schooling with a fresh eye, I think it would be fair to say that it that it looks to me like what's going on there is that the purpose of it is to maintain the status quo, to keep things on an even keel and going just the way they're going and getting everybody into the social order that exists at, at the time. We're so saying that that it, that's again constraining and and it prevents the growth and development of of not just individuals but of the society so paul um we're gonna have to close in a minute um okay and it's it's very very exciting to speak with you i'm wondering um for our parents at home how do you take one little step in this direction do you feel uh, I, I think the one little step that's possible is at home or in your neighborhood, not in school. I, I think schools are beyond salvation. We, we've seen this for, for the history of school reform over the last hundred years, is that there are these incremental changes in schools, and, and but they don't really affect the the institutional structure. They don't affect these things that we are trying to, to change to propose, uh, you know, that, yep. the, and so, so I think uh, the only, the only answer uh, is, is if, if an institution ossifies to the point where, where it can't change, then you just have to replace it. So there's no incrementalism possible that will succeed. You just have to start over. And so that's what we're proposing. We're saying, you know, you can't go a little step at a time because people have been doing that for a hundred years and really have gotten nowhere with it. Uh, so, so okay. but so at I, home, 
Yep. At home, it is possible. You have control over that environment. So at home, it's possible to go, take steps in this direction. Uh, in your neighborhood, it, it may be possible to take steps in this direction. And uh, if you stop to think about it, the home and the neighborhood actually are more effective places of learning than schools are. There was a study done by the United Nations in 17, na in 17 different countries about 40 years ago uh, to try to determine what, what were the most important factors in success in school. And they, it turned out that the top three had nothing to do with school. It had to do with the home environment and the neighborhood and so forth. So one last question. Um, what's your next step with the learning park? Well, we're at a point where we, we have made uh, uh, as many proposals uh, and suggestions for a new way of doing things as we are, re are ready to make. We want to keep it open because what our next step is, is, is uh, we are searching the, the United States and a few other countries for some community that would be interested in trying this new way of educating. And, and so we're going to spend a year or two trying to locate a place like that, going and talking to people about what we're suggesting and, and seeing if, if there are a group of people in, in some community somewhere that want to give this a try as, you know, just as a, let's, let's see if it works. Let's see what the outcome is. Um, again, I think that's, the outcome is a very important part of learning. Learning, I think, is significant only if you can experience the outcome of whatever is learned. Or, right. and, and so, so uh, because the outcome then turns out to be the real meaning of it. And uh, so that's what we're, we're at our point right now in our development, we are searching for some community that wants to give this a try. And, we're the, and then we're offering our help to do that in whatever way we, we can help in, a, in whatever way that community wants us to help. That's great. And anyone watching this who would like to learn more can go to um, Paul's website, which is on the chat. Um, do you want to give us the name of that one more time? Yes, it's, uh, uh, it's neweducation.org, www.neweducation.org. And uh, there's a contact point at us. You can just send us a message. And... Um, I'm happy to talk with anybody. I mean, uh, you know, if you contact me through the through our website, I'll just I'll just send you an email from my own personal uh, e uh, email address, and we can talk. Great, great. Uh, I want to thank you so much. I also want to make a pitch that many of the ideas that Paul is talking about is is infused in all of the classes that we teach at RoboFund. So check us out also at robofund.org. We're in over 100 schools working within a constrained system, but working to have really creative, fun, joyful, student-centered classes. So could I, could I make a, a comment yes. before we Absolutely. sign off? Yep. So, um, so I, the thing that I just mentioned about, about uh, real learning happens when you experience the consequence of your actions. Yeah. Uh, the part of the learning, uh, the purpose of a learning park is to create a, 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 a place where learners of all ages can safely experience the consequences of their actions. And the other thing I wanted to mention, which is also neglected and most people don't even think about it, is that, it, is that we believe very strongly that a learning park needs to embrace a place where all human arts are accessible and practiced every day. And, I, and by human arts, we don't mean just painting and sculpting and music, but also all the mechanical arts, design, construction, landscaping, interior decorating, and athletics, because we see all of these as human arts. I like that term, human arts. I haven't heard that before. That's, that's very nice. And I agree with the concept completely. So, all right. I think we, this is a wrap. We've had a really wonderful time. Uh, thank you for everyone. We have, wait, wait, we have one more comment. Parents, grandparents can stop anywhere that has something is happening. Um, water department is digging a hole in your street and ask what's going on there. Many workers are happy to explain. Thank you, Susan. Um, I have a perpetual uh, 
uh, drilling going on at my corner at 66th and West End Avenue. I've lived here for almost 30 years. And every couple of months, they're trying to figure it out and have not yet figured it out. But I, and I'm very curious and uh, yet I don't quite feel like I'm gonna go over there and ask, even though I would like to go over there and ask. So I, I relate to your comments, Susan. So, all right, we're gonna end. And uh, this has been a fantastic conversation. And I think Paul, it'd be really fun to talk again and see six months or a year from now, is anyone grabbing it? Are you able to see progress moving forward? So. That'd be I great. So. so thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank you for my for our audience. Oh yeah. Well thanks for everybody. Yeah. <laughs>